would like to take you back to the moment this TED Talk was born. And it was in June 2003, when I was invited to celebrate summer solstice, which is the longest day of the year, in the best ever place to celebrate it, Stockholm. Although this may sound great, I actually went there with mixed feelings. I had just lost my job, and it happened to be one of my former colleagues who had invited me over. So you might imagine how I might have felt. But when I got there, my spirits picked up. You know the stereotype of Sweden? Lakes and dotted by colored cottages? Yes, it was all true. And even the weather turned nice and pleasant. But when the party started, you could see me doing a weird sort of tango. I was trying to evade my team, and I didn't know any other people. And in situations such as these, miracles happen, and my mine was called Bob. Bob was a huge guy in all respects. He was tall, he was broad, and he was big-bellied. And he was from Groningen. Not really the talkative type, and we decided to keep on drinking and talking until the sky would turn a shade brighter. What I didn't know, I was a virgin to this experience before, what I didn't know is that it would result in two things. One, one of the best conversations that I'd ever had, and two, one of my worst hangovers. Bob turned out to be a self-employed entrepreneur, a software developer, and he confided to me. He told me, Avert, I totally love my job, but I hate sales. I hate those moments we as entrepreneurs all know so well when jobs end. I totally hate it. But at that time, not as I am now, I was not an entrepreneur. And at that moment, I didn't have any track record in sales. So it was very uncomfortable, but I didn't know what to advise him. And suddenly, at 5.30 a.m., the horizon turned a shade brighter, and we went to bed. My epiphany struck me a few hours later, in, yeah, only a few hours, in a coffee shop in Stockholm. We had both picked up a huge tray of breakfast and a big mug of coffee. And when I walked with Bob over to our table, I blurted out, Bob, what would it be like if you would never ever do sales again and only talk about the work you love so much? Bob was thunderstruck. We'll meet Bob later during our talk today. A little under 18 minutes from now, you will be walking out of here with three concrete actions to fuel the future with your passion. And this tech talk today uh, is about the future. It's about the future of talent and the life and the livelihoods we hold. The talk came to me because we all are witness to huge disruptive changes in the landscape of work. It feels as if both the definition of what we call work and the level of technological augmentation is changing incredibly rapidly. And the question is why? Why is this happening? Well, let me take um, the well-researched US labor market as an example to tell you a little bit about this. And I'm taking data from McKinsey, and McKinsey is an American consulting firm. As it now stands, we can already automate across all levels of education, across all sorts of jobs worldwide, we can already automate about 45% of our work activities with currently available and demonstrated technology. We don't even need superhuman powers to do it. We can already do it. And there is room for 13% more as soon as technology catches up with understanding human language. That's reason one. The second reason is that our interest rates are now incredibly low. You could say that capital is now cheaper than people. If you would combine these two factors, you would see the hot debt for an acceleration of automation in organization, in organization, even beyond areas such as robotics and manufacturing. In fact, the age we are now all entering is either called the fourth machine age or the second, uh, the fourth, sorry, <laughs> the fourth industrial revolution or the second machine age. And in, in case you haven't heard these words before, uh, the second machine age, what does that mean? 
Well, you could say that in the first machine age, we were telling machines what to do. Right? We're still thinking about programmers. That's telling machines what to do. But in the second machine age, machines are telling themselves what to do. Well, that does sound incredibly abstract, right? So let me tell you a bit of a story. Suppose you would join me in visiting an Amazon warehouse today. Amazon, you know, from the books. If you would join me in visiting an Amazon warehouse, you see these huge cabinets with all sorts of goods, from books to bears to everything. You'll see them running around freely in the warehouse. And they're picked up by small Roomba-like robots that position themselves under the cabinet, lift those cabinets marginally up from the ground, and transport those cabinets wherever they're needed. So if goods are in high demand, if you, for instance, buy a book, the cabinet with that book moves closer to the packers. If it's not in high demand, the cabinet moves to the back of the bus. The question is, is anyone telling these Roomba robots what to do and where to go? No. They're learning autonomously and are programming themselves. So, what will this mach second machine age mean for all of us? Let me take you for a bit of a spin through history before we answer this question. You could say that yesterday we only automated what was dirty, dangerous, or dull. And that, we thought, honestly, was just fine. Just take our own history in Holland, for example. How many miners in Holland died to lung disease before their retirement? But tomorrow, we'll automate almost everything. Research by Oxford University analyzes that we're now at the moment where we're starting to automate more knowledge-intensive work. And to give you a bit of a perspective, these are the predictions. In 20 years, in the next two decades, about 47% of all jobs in the U.S. will be gone through technology. And with current employment in the U.S. standing at 144 million, that's 67 million jobs. In Europe, 33% of all jobs will be lost. You might feel a little bit of a relief, right? But we have 261 million jobs in Europe, meaning that we'll, in Europe we'll lose 89 million jobs. I can feel you thinking, and I'm thinking the same, that's in 20 years, right? But in the U.S. alone, in the coming five years, 5.1 million jobs will be lost. What will this all mean to all of us? What will we do when our jobs are lost? The question is really, what do we do when our jobs are lost? Because you might know your current job quite well, but how to know something that you don't know? There is simply so much to learn in the world. So what do we do when we lose our jobs? It's tough to do it, right? You may wonder what our talk about or talk of today is going to be about. Is it going to be about the advice of the World Economic Forum that we'll have to educate for life and reskill far more frequently than we used to? I have no objections to these wise counsels, but all these wise counsels do not paint the entire picture. All these counsels talk about what we do, but we're not only about what we do, right? We're also who we are. And who we are is a far more fundamental question. It's not only about our knowledge and our skills. Who we are is about our drives, our motivations, our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations. If I would draw it in terms of a picture, I would draw it as a vertical infinity sign with what we do at the top and who we are at the bottom. And ideally, this picture is aligned. So we're working from our strengths and talents in the real world. But to be honest, I found these ideal state to be exceedingly and excruciatingly rare. Two more states are far more common. We're very active in the world of work, but who we are is something completely different. Or we're very active in the world of work and we have no clue who we really are. Now suppose that either someone in these two, say it, non-aligned states would lose his or her job. What would be the consequence? Well, you get it. Panic and confusion. Why? Well, simply because so much of us derive our identity out of what we do, and if we lose our job, we become lost. You might feel a little bit hopeless, right, at this stage in my talk. So where do we go from here? 
What do we do? Are there any personal handles to come out of this situation? Well, I believe there are, and I would like to tell you three stories to tell this story. And there are three things that we can do, and those are the three things that I promised at the beginning of the talk. I believe that we can ignite our untapped talents, that we can invest in our essence, and that we can improve since it's better to get better. Let's start with the first thing, ignite our untapped talents. Remember Bob from the beginning of our talk? Interestingly enough, my story with Bob didn't end in 2003. It ended in 2004 at another party hosted by my former team member. I rather liked it. She threw good parties. And Bob and I run into each other again. And the moment he lays eyes on me, he takes a beeline in my direction, shakes my hand and tells me, Avert, I'm now far more successful than I ever was with far less headache. Without knowing it at the time in 2003, Bob's talent, untapped talent, were ignited. So what is ignition? Ignition is the discovery of your untapped talents, the things, the drives, the norms that you really didn't know that you really held. Well, that sounds almost impossible, right, to get to know yourself on that level. But it is possible. I believe that there are quite a few things that we can do. We can find a good coach, since it takes two to tango. Uh, we can take time for introspection and deep reflection in a state of mild happiness. And this one's interesting. I have David Rock to thank for the insight. Mild happiness, neurologically, does very good things. Or we can take tests, as many as we can. VIA tests, MBTI tests, Strength Finder. But in the end, don't rely on tests alone. Do the work. Think about it. What are your untapped talents? And you may wonder what it will feel like when your untapped talents are ignited. Well, it can feel ex exhilarating and... Well, excruciating and weird. Remember Bob from our talk? The moment your untapped talents are ignited, it's time to invest in your assets. And let me introduce Diana to tell her story what that looks like. I met Diana a couple of weeks ago. And Diana is a small woman. She has a lovely voice, a radiant personality. And she's easily touched by stories of her colleagues. She's a manager at a Dutch bank. And I met her at a training session that we held. I was rather touched by her personal story where she told me that she was trying to juggle a growing career, a growing family, and taking care of her parents who were both struck by Parkinson's disease. We asked of all the participants to formulate a goal for themselves for the years ahead, and Diana chose to speak out. When then we asked her what talents she would use to reach that goal, and she suddenly realized that she was using different talents at home and at work. And she was suddenly struck with the realization, I will use some of my talents that I only use at home, my caring nature, at work to reach my goal. This is what I would like to call invest. Invest is not only taking time to discover your untapped talents, but also to strengthen them, to invest in them. And this may sound super self-evident, but you have to realize that in corporations and institutions, about 80% of all training and development and performance management is about mitigating weaknesses rather than building on strengths. We've ignited, we've invested, now it's time to improve. And to improve, since it's better to get better, let me introduce Anne. It's a dreary, cold, sleety, about this kind of weather, and it's a training session, I'm way too early, and I'm standing before a dark office. Nobody's in yet. And a few moments later, somebody opens up the office, I get into the office for warm coffee and tea. And I lay, lock eyes with Anne. Anne is about my age, she's a wonderful woman, and she has a hearing disability in both ears. And she tells me, Avert, I haven't actually been invited to this training session because my managers have no confidence in me developing the sales skills in question. But I put myself on the training roster. Ignite it, you bet. First question to Anne and all the other participants was, what are your talents? And Anne, to her surprise, discovered hers to be curiosity. Well, you can imagine how surprised she was that she could drive her sales skills to the application of curiosity, her innate love for listening. That realization made her improve her sales skills incredibly quickly. 
At the end of the day, she had to call eight prospects, managed to secure four face-to-face meetings, that's a conversion rate, second and third, of about 50%, double that of the group average. What is to improve? To improve is to learn, to act, to reflect, and to improve. And it's the realization that learning for life can be totally okay if it's in line with who we are. Now, if you would ask me, Aver, honestly, will these changes of the fourth industrial revolution or the second machine age, will they really happen? And I'd have to say, yes, I'm afraid they will. And why? For the very simple reason that we have a history of these changes already in our past. For instance, if we wouldn't have had the previous three industrial revolutions, we'd all still be farmers. We, me as a farmer. <laughs> but today's talk is not about gloom and doom. I truly believe we have so much to gain and the future has so much to gain if we use our untapped talents, provided we take time, people and organizations alike, to ignite, invest, and improve. But if you would ask me the question, Avert, do you think we are doing enough to reconcile the future? Then I would say, no, not at all. I pray for a massive boost to learning and self-discovery, way, way beyond what institutions and people alike are currently investing. Let's light a fire. Thanks.